You ate a bagel for breakfast two hours ago, and now you're staring at the clock, feeling like you could nap under your desk. Ever wonder why some meals leave you buzzing with energy, while others make you feel like you got hit by a truck? Today, I'll explain how glucose and insulin work together like you're five years old. By the end, you'll understand why your energy crashes, what's really happening inside your body after you eat, and exactly which tiny meal tweaks will keep you energized all day. Most people think blood sugar is only something diabetics worry about. But here's the truth. Every single person on Earth rides a glucose roller coaster all day long. When you eat carbohydrates, whether it's bread, pasta, fruit, or candy, your body breaks them down into glucose. That glucose floods into your bloodstream, your blood sugar rises, and your pancreas immediately notices and releases insulin, a hormone whose job is to clear that glucose out of your blood. Think of insulin as a key that unlocks your cells so glucose can get inside. Without that key, glucose just sits in your bloodstream with nowhere to go. Insulin opens the doors to your muscles, your liver, and when those are full, your fat cells. This entire system is normal. It's not good or bad, it just is. Your body is designed to run on glucose. Your brain uses about 120 grams of it every single day. That's roughly the amount in 10 slices of bread, all burned just by thinking, breathing, and staying alive. Your muscles need glucose to move. Your organs need it to function. But glucose can't just float around in your bloodstream forever. Too much glucose hanging around damages blood vessels, nerves, and organs over time. That's why diabetics who can't produce enough insulin end up with vision problems, kidney damage, and nerve pain. So insulin sweeps it up and stores it. The system works. It's been working for thousands of years. But the size and speed of the glucose spike changes everything about how you feel. Here's what you need to understand. A small, gradual rise in glucose requires a small, gentle insulin response. Your body handles it smoothly, energy stays stable, you feel fine. But a massive spike in glucose, like what happens when you eat a stack of pancakes with syrup on an empty stomach, triggers a massive insulin response. Your pancreas floods your bloodstream with insulin to deal with the emergency. Insulin clears that glucose fast, maybe too fast, and suddenly your blood sugar drops lower than where you started. That's the crash. That foggy, irritable, starving feeling that hits you an hour after a big carb meal. You're not imagining it. Your blood sugar actually dropped below baseline. And your body interprets that drop as starvation, even though you just ate. So it screams at you to eat again to bring levels back up. This is why you can feel ravenously hungry 90 minutes after a huge breakfast. You're not broken. You're just experiencing reactive hypoglycemia the technical term for that post-spike crash. The size of the spike also determines where that glucose ends up. When your muscles and liver have room, they store glucose as glycogen. That's great! It's ready fuel for later. Your muscles can hold about 400 grams of glycogen, and your liver holds about 100 grams. But when those storage tanks are full, insulin has nowhere left to put the glucose, except fat cells. This is how your body stores extra energy for times when food is scarce. Not because you're bad. Not because carbs are evil. Just because the system is designed to save energy for later, and fat cells are the long-term parking lot. The more often you spike your glucose high, the more often insulin has to make big deposits into fat storage. Over time, your cells can also become less sensitive to insulin signal, meaning you need more and more insulin to do the same job. That's called insulin resistance, and it's the root cause of type 2 diabetes. Now here's where it gets interesting. You can't control whether glucose rises or whether insulin shows up. That's automatic. It's metabolism. But you can absolutely influence how high the spike goes and how fast it happens. And that's where the magic lives. Small shifts in how you eat the exact same foods can completely reshape your glucose curve, your insulin response, and how you feel all day long. Start with fiber and protein. If you eat those before carbohydrates, they slow down digestion. Imagine your stomach as a funnel. Carbs alone pour through fast, but fiber and protein clog the funnel just enough to make everything move slower. That means glucose trickles into your bloodstream instead of flooding it. Smaller spike. Gentler insulin response. Longer lasting energy. You could eat the exact same bagel, but if you eat a handful of almonds and some Greek yogurt first, the glucose response is totally different. Same food. Different order, different outcome. One study showed that eating vegetables before carbs reduced the glucose spike by up to 73% compared to eating carbs first. Pairing carbs with protein or fat works the same way. 
A cookie by itself causes a sharp spike. A cookie with peanut butter smooths it out. The fat and protein slow the breakdown of the carbs. Your body has to work harder to separate everything, so glucose enters your blood more gradually. This isn't about avoiding carbs. It's about changing the delivery speed. Think of it like opening a fire hydrant versus turning on a garden hose. Same water, totally different impact. Then there's movement. When you walk after a meal, your muscles start pulling glucose directly out of your bloodstream to fuel the activity. They don't even need insulin to do it. It's called non-insulin-mediated glucose uptake, and it's one of the best tools you have. A 10-minute walk after eating can drop your glucose spike by up to 30%. That means less insulin needed, less chance of a crash, more stable energy. You're literally burning off the glucose before it can cause a problem. This is why cultures that traditionally walk after meals, like many Mediterranean and Asian societies, tend to have lower rates of diabetes. Even weird tricks like vinegar matter. Studies show that a tablespoon of vinegar in water before a meal slows how fast your stomach empties food into your intestines. Slower emptying means slower glucose release. It's not magic, it's just chemistry. The acetic acid in vinegar delays digestion, and delayed digestion equals smaller spikes. One study found that vinegar reduced post-meal glucose spikes by about 20%. Some people swear by it, others think it tastes terrible. But the mechanism is real. This matters to you because these spikes and crashes affect everything. Your energy, your mood, your focus, your hunger, your long-term risk for chronic disease. When your blood sugar is stable, you feel calm and clear. When it's bouncing around like a ping pong ball, you feel anxious, tired, and constantly hungry. You might snap at your coworker over nothing or feel unable to concentrate during an important meeting. You're not weak. You're not broken. You're just riding a glucose roller coaster that your daily habits built. And those same habits can smooth it out. The bigger point is this. Glucose and insulin are not your enemies. They're tools. Your body uses them to manage energy. But the way you eat, move, and structure your day shapes how well those tools work. You don't need to count carbs or avoid entire food groups. You just need to understand that the order you eat food, what you pair it with, and whether you move afterward all change the outcome. Same bagel, same body. Completely different metabolic story depending on the context around it. So to recap, when you eat carbs, glucose rises and insulin clears it into muscles, liver, or fat. Big spikes trigger big insulin responses, which cause crashes and push more glucose into fat storage. You can't stop the process, but you can control the size and speed of the spike. Eat fiber or protein first. Pair carbs with fat or protein. Walk for 10 minutes after meals. Even vinegar before eating can help. These small changes don't eliminate glucose or insulin. They just make your body handle energy more smoothly. So here's my question for you. What's one meal today where you could try eating your protein or vegetables first before touching the carbs? And will you actually notice a difference in how you feel an hour later?